Severance is a show about ghosts. Yeah, it's also a show about how corporate space will weaponize any and all features of the world, such as art, the concept of family, and even the ownership of memory. But it's also about ghosts. The Maraca. Excellent choice. There are no supernatural figments, poltergeists, or specters in the Severance universe. Though there is something otherworldly and insidious at play that we will get to later. But for now, I will say that the ghosts created in Severance are made of two components, memory and history. I also intend to contribute my theories as to where the show is going and what the hell Lumen is really doing down there in the blank goo elevator realm. Warning, major spoilers. Severance is a science fiction drama taking place in Delaware, Delaware, United States. The time period the series is set in could be three years from our present day or 20 years. I've seen individuals online theorize that it's 15 years in the past, but in an alternate timeline where flip phones are still in vogue. You know, because something, 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 Apple doesn't exist. The point is that Severance's world is familiar, but with some uncomfortable additions. In this world, a powerful, but not too outwardly powerful corporation known as Lumen offers to its employees a brain procedure known as Severance. Hey, that's the name of the show. This procedure allows for an individual's memories to be spatially controlled and dictated. So when Mark Scout enters the Lumen elevator and the Severance worker's floor, he remembers nothing of his life, his trauma, or his history. He only remembers his birth on the Severance floor and the days of labor and existence on that floor. Severance pretty blatantly asks its viewers to consider the myriad of moral and psychological issues with this process. Severed workers are controlled, gaslit, infantilized, and often denied dignity by the unsevered Lumen staff. In his introduction to Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, Alfred Mac Adams writes, What is a ghost, after all, but a repressed memory? The past demanding to be heard in the present. What are dungeons and secret passages and fantastic castles, if not the places in the human mind where the subconscious hides and our darkest secrets wait to be discovered? Using this line of reasoning, we can argue that the severed workers are ghosts to themselves, the versions allowed to leave, and vice versa. Protagonist Mark Scout is haunted by the death and memory of his wife, while simultaneously being stalked by his boss from the severance floor, who he doesn't realize torments him in one life and manipulates him from another. The severed floor is effectively a labyrinth, where these repressions are trapped in both the dream of their other selves and theorize what their other selves are like. Essay writer Kathy on Vaulter 2.0 has gone into greater detail on the concept of severance as analogous to hauntings and being possessed by demons. One of the best hypotheses that she puts forward is the concept of a demon who enters a host's body, but when is exercised, then the body just sort of magically doesn't have any of that trauma? That is not the case for characters in Severance. Severance doesn't shy away from the allusions to death and ghosts either. In episode one of the series, aptly titled The Good News About Hell, primary character Heliar tries to unsuccessfully use a stairwell to escape from the Severance floor. On her last failed attempt, she asks protagonist Mark Scout, or Mark S, am I dead? Furthermore, there's a funeral very early on for a character who initially is introduced as missing and as phantom-like. Kier Egan, the founder of Lumen, in a recording that is put forward in a museum where severed workers go to alleviate the metric ton of existential dread they hold in themselves, mentions his own death in relation to him realizing his greatest creations. I know that death is near upon me because people have begun to ask what I see as my life's great achievement. They wish to know how they should remember me as I rot. In my life, I have identified four components which I call tempers, from which are derived every human soul. Woe, frolic, dread, malice. Each man's character is defined by the precise ratio that resides in him. I walked into the cave of my own mind, and there I tamed them. Should you tame the tempers as I did mine, then the world shall become your appendage. It is this great and consecrated power that I hope to pass on to all of you, my children. 
Cobell, an antagonist of the series and another ghost haunting Mark. Besides being a religious fanatic for Cure and the Lumen Corporation, is often talking about the afterlife hell or some combination. Which brings me to my next point, Lumen's goals. I'm going to say right now that I don't entirely think this show is about what Lumen is doing. In fact, just the practice of severing workers is abhorrent and uncanny enough that if there was no great and grand goal behind this sanitized and inoffensive Pee Wee's Playhouse nightmare building, I think the show's premise could still function in some capabilities. The amount of characterization this show focuses on, alongside the frequent philosophical and hypothetical questions the show asks, are the forefront. This is a story more focused on character than plot. But there is a mystery here. Even if this show is about the gratification of escaping a hell that seems unstoppable, there is still the question of what the hell Lumen is doing. So it's unclear what exactly Lumen does. Mark has been told he's in the archival department, but we learn quickly that is not true at all. Mark's role amounts to essentially guiding his department to look at numbers that give off bad vibes. In a way, this is also another form of haunting. When building theories off of stories that use obfuscation or unreliable narrators, it's always worth the extra effort to pay close attention to the people who clearly know more than our frame narrators. Mark, Helly, Irving, and Dylan are our narrators, but they are fundamentally unreliable on account of the whole messing with their brains and also being very driven by impulsive and desperate motivations. I admit, this strategy doesn't always work, Sometimes you learn six seasons in a movie or three trilogies in an art book later that none of this was planned and they were just burning money in a cartoony, old-timey hobo can, grabbing references like they were going out of style with no understanding of the original source material. But in well-written content that showcases evidence of a payoff and a track record, it's hard not to build theories for what comes next especially when the content ends on a cliffhanger with the unresolved thread of what the company does. The situationally aware villains are still unreliable, but they know more information than our primary frame narrators. Harmony Cobell, Seth Milchek, Mr. Grainer, Helena, the current Egan CEO, and Dr. Regabe are all in the loop. We get varying degrees of interaction with these individuals, some more than others, but each of them, I believe, gives us a window into the end goals of Lumen. Immortality for Kier Egan and mass control of the population under him. Let's begin with Seth Milchek. Grainer is the floor security and Harmony is the head of the Severance Floor Department, but Milchek not only at times works against these two, but also seems to take on both of their roles. He also seems to simultaneously be a doctor and caretaker with a flair for an emotional enforcer in ways that Grainer is not. He leads trust exercises, is the primary organizer of parties, and is even able to pull psychological warfare protocols to keep the severed employees in check. During the workplace intro party for Heli, Milchek makes an interesting comment about death. I think this is a good time to remind ourselves that things like deaths happen outside of here. Not here. A life at Lumen is protected from such things. And I think a great potential response to that from all of you is gratitude. I also think that melon isn't getting any tastier. This line struck me on my second viewing of Severance because it's not entirely true. Severed employees, when they retire, die because they can no longer be woken up. But Milchek states that the death on the outside cannot affect the world of the Severance floor. This implication of undeath, the idea that the severance floor is working towards some form of hive mind, but also immortality, occurs when we see Milchek for the first and only time in the outside world interrogating Dylan on the whereabouts of a stolen piece of data. Speaking of the outside world, let's talk about Harmony Cobell. Harmony Cobell is the head of the severance floor, and like Milchek or any of the purposes on the floor, it's strange what she does because functionally, she is the equivalent of an emotional abuser there to keep the main characters in line. 
She's an imposing boss, and also one of the largest emotional violations of Mark's existence as she has cultivated an entire personality outside of the Severance floor just to spy on him. But why? Well, from the first moment we meet Mark, we learn he is somewhat different from the other employees on the Severance floor. He has a glass cube! Hooray! This detail becomes immensely important since we learn that object wealth and the reward systems are one of the only small joys allowed to the severed workers. This clue feature is the same with Heli, who Milchek is often documenting with a black and white camera, despite none of the other Severn employees receiving this unique treatment. So it only makes sense that Mark represents some feature of the severed floor experiment that is unique. He gets a cube. And for some reason, that interests Harmony enough to go against Lumen Protocol, spy on him, insert herself into his family life, and Mark does seem to genuinely care about her. So why did Mark join Lumen and get his glass cube? He got into a car accident and his wife died. The wife who is also alive, and is a ghost, literally trying to find him, but never exactly reaching him. Your Audi likes films and owns a machine that can play them. And what is Harmony obsessed with? Finding a way to see if Mark and Miss Casey remember one another. Harmony frequently mentions deaths in her family, whether it's a husband or a dead mother. I'm not going to talk much about Grainer. His character extends to a cruel plot device and the implication that he and Harmony have a weird push and pull with one another. He does die, which makes me wonder if we won't see more ghost horror later with him. And Natalie is a character I want to talk more about, but unfortunately we know very little, besides the fact that she is the messenger of gods. Which probably won't be important. Maybe. I want to instead talk about Egan, and I mean all of them. In episode 3 of Severance, also known as In Perpetuity, we hear the voice of Kier Egan, the first iteration and the founder of Lumen. The Perpetuity Wing itself is like a museum to Egan and his family's existence. There is art of Egan in many facets, even the one, supposedly, where he meets his wife. The mythology of the founder himself is perpetual in all ways. In the Perpetuity Wing, we are greeted by a few of the following quotes from Egan, the founder, and his descendants. History lives in us, whether we learn it or not. I know that death is near upon me because people have begun to ask what I see as my life's greatest achievement. They wish to know how they should remember me as I rot. We also hear from Myrtle Egan, the first female CEO, that she was required to recite a bedtime story every night. We know later that Helena was made to do something similar. Myrtle also claims that through her blood, Kier and his mission are made true. Then we meet Helena's father, who speaks with a dialectic straight from the Uncanny Valley. Everybody in the whole world should get one. But he says a series of important details to consider. The Your grandfather would cherish, would cherish what, what you've, you've done. done. And one day you will sit with me at my revolving. You will sit with me at my revolving. Any of these features and clues appear to be building up to one villain monologue and my belief that not only is Lumen trying to find a way to cheat death, but also to immortalize Kier Egan and his male descendants. They'll all be Kier's children. And you might say to me, immortality and mass control, that's not a unique twist. And I remind you, this show is not about twists. It's about characterization. And Severance characterizes evil in a few ways that I believe are central to the plot. Evil is cruel for the sake of cruelty. Evil will try to close all avenues of nuance to you. Evil is more simplistic than we believe, despite it holding immense power. The pure hubris that is meddling against death is what invites spirits to a haunted place. A ritual and a disturbance. That is the procedure of severance in the show, and those are the ghosts untombed by Helena's family and the Lumen Corporation. 